Praise the Lord. Welcome everyone to class. Thank you all for uh, joining class. We'll uh, continue with uh, learning about the humanity of Jesus Christ. How, uh, what was the purpose of the incarnation? Why did uh, Christ have to become man and take on the fullness of humanity? Okay. And we will also look at what was God doing through the humanity of Jesus Christ that he could not do by any other means. Okay. So we are looking at various scripture passages. Uh, we saw that no one has seen God or can see God because he lives in unapproachable light. Uh, so the incarnation made it possible for God's final and complete revelation to be revealed to mankind for us to know uh, the living God. We also begin to know the nature of God, his works, and know him as he is. Okay? It is also God revealing and speaking to man. It is the word is manifested, is being made known, and we can understand him. We also uh, saw that, you know, uh, God becoming flesh uh, made a way for him to be put to death, okay, in his human body. So we see that the human body basically provided uh, a means for Christ uh, to become that perfect, sinless, sacrificial lamb, okay, without any spot or blem blemish. And he made that full, complete, sufficient, and final sacrifice once for all for the sins of all humanity. Okay, And um, because he became and made this complete, sufficient, and final sacrifice for sins for all humanity, we also saw that, you know, um, we are free from guilt, okay, from every condemnation, from every shame. And no more sacrifices for uh, sin is needed. Okay. And uh, we are also being presented as holy and blameless without accusation before God the Father. And we also saw last uh, class on, uh, on Friday how through his death God and man were reconciled. Okay. So we'll continue uh, looking at how in the flesh jesus condemned sin sin in his flesh so before we continue looking at that can one of you please lead us in prayer please someone who's never prayed before can we hear some voice from the online class sister shall i go ahead yes please lucy thank you Loving Heavenly Father, thank you, Father God, for blessing this hour in our lives to study your word, O oh Master Lord, to know the, the spiritual truth, O oh Master Lord. As we learn your spiritual truth, O oh Master Lord, let your word get deep rooted into us, O oh Father, that to reap the fruits of your word, O oh Father Lord, so that we will be a blessing to others and we uh, blessing to others whom we interact, O oh Father Lord Jesus. Lord, just we submit this hour into your hands as to lead us and guide us in learning your word lord jesus lord jesus we also submit in person students online students as well as our faculties into your precious hands oh lord in jesus mighty and holy name we pray amen amen thank you lucy so we saw that um in in his flesh jesus condemned sin what's the meaning of condemned i said last week what's the meaning of condemned sin Uh, not that condemned. He condemned sin in the flesh means what? Dominated sin over the flesh. Yes, he dominated, he subdued, he overpowered sin. He deprived sin of its power, okay, in the flesh, okay? So, uh, why, does, why are we looking at that Jesus condemned sin in the flesh why are we mentioning it any thoughts why are we saying this point jesus condemned sin in the flesh
so we are we are still in the flesh and we are immune to we are still, we still, are, in, we the are still in the flesh yes okay and what else did you say can you like we are uh, 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 immune to sin okay because uh, uh, sin is so dominating our flesh yes okay so we're saying that hey even though jesus was fully man he was able to condemn sin in the flesh that means he was able to control sin overpower sin subdue sin that means keep sin subdued you know and because of that he uh, he, he was not he, jesus did not give in to the dictates of the flesh that means the flesh dictates hey you know somebody has wronged you you wrong them back somebody said some uh, one bad word you give them two three bad words you know somebody has uh, taught you a lesson you teach them double lesson three teach them nicely you know or somebody was rude to you you don't help them you be rude to them even when you can give so that is a dictates of the flesh the craving sinful cravings of the flesh okay so it's saying that when jesus was able to overpower sin we can also overcome power sin in the flesh we can also subdue sin in the flesh you know we can follow the guidance of the holy spirit and we can keep the righteous requirements of the law the righteous requirements of the law can be fulfilled because christ did it we can also do it okay so remember we were talking about the law yes how we were not able to keep the law so when jesus was able to keep the law okay he was without sin he was able to overpower sin we can also now keep the righteous demands of the laws we can keep the commandments and how can we do it with the because we are clothed with the righteousness of jesus okay and the empowerment of the holy spirit the power of the holy spirit and because of the righteousness of jesus you know uh, in um, romans uh, paul talks the righteousness of jesus is imputed on us you know when we say that we are made righteous what does it mean we are made righteous when we are born again we are made righteous means what how are we made righteous because of the blood of jesus christ the blood of jesus christ covers our sin okay that means god's christ's righteousness has been put into our account his righteousness has been imputed means has been put into our account so we are standing before god not with our own righteousness not because of the works that we have done that has made us righteous but because christ's righteousness has been put into our account so in our bank account so to say is god's christ righteousness and that is why we are called the righteous of god the righteousness of god because of the righteousness of jesus and also we can keep the law and the commandments by the empowering of the holy spirit okay we will look at um, why did jesus have to partake in flesh and blood some of points we look at the threefold purpose why did jesus have to share in our humanity why did he have to share in our flesh and blood we look at one more passage in hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 and 18 and here we look at the three purposes for the incarnation and one consequence of it so can one of you please read hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 to 18 please in as much then as the children having have partaken of flesh and blood he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death that is the devil and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage for indeed he does not give aid to angels but he does give aid to the seed of abraham therefore in all things he had to be made like him his brethren that he might be a merciful and a faithful high priest in things pertaining to god to make propitiation for the sins of the people for in all for in that he himself has suffered being tempted he is able to aid those who are tempted amen such powerful verses so we look at the threefold purpose um, why jesus 
partook of flesh and blood? Uh, why did he have to partake in the flesh and blood? Why did he have to share in our humanity? Uh, a few more points. The first thing here in this Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 to 18 is he shared in our humanity so that he can destroy the power of death. Okay. And who had the power of death? Who had the power of death? Satan, the devil. Okay. Um, so we read in we read in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. Okay, so we see that this uh, prophecy came to be fulfilled. We also read in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, where John writes and says that Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. Okay. Not only did Christ destroy the works of the devil, but through his death, Christ destroyed the devil himself. Okay. Now, the Greek word for destroy means what? It means to paralyze, to undo, to bring to nothing, to make to no effect. So, on the cross, Satan's power is paralyzed. Okay. He has no more power. He's paralyzed, no power. All his power is undone, okay, it's come to nothing and made to no effect. But most of us here believe that the devil is very, very, some of you are smiling. Most of you feel that devil is very, very powerful. So we say, Shaitan mujhe bohut satara hai, bohut kaam kar raha hai. Some, you know, we, we, we say that you know, Satan is doing this, he's doing that, and we, are, we think he's more powerful. Right? But here, when Jesus, it says, when Jesus died on the cross, he, what does he say? It says here, he destroyed the power, he destroyed the, him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Hebrews chapter, please look at your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, it says that he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. So the word destroy means what? Not uh, do away, get away, done with, death, nash karna, no. But it is actually causing him to be paralyzed, ineffective. He has no more powers. So if you look at your enemy, you must just look at him and say, when he does something and he's, you're scared of your enemy and the devil, you must say, hey, actually, you don't have any power. But some of us think the enemy has a lot of power. You know why? Because he's trying to lie to you by using gorilla war tactics. You know what is gorilla war tactics? What is gorilla war tactics? You know, some of these uh, like groups, like the Naxalites and all of those, they are like, you know, use gorilla war tactics because they know that the Indian government has kept them under subjection. They have no power. Okay. But what they'll do is they'll go to that territory and they'll try to terrorize people. If you don't give me this, we'll shoot the entire village down. We'll shoot you down, you know, or we'll destroy you, your family. So just fear. And for fear, we will all give in. So even if you look at various religious cultures, why they do their rituals is because they're so scared of the devil. You know, they do all the rituals, they, they give the so-called gods and goddesses so much of sacrifices, so to ward and keep away the devil. The devil has basically terrorized them. But actually, they, you know, we fail to see that we are actually in a place of greater power and authority and our devil is underneath our feet. He is actually powerless. He has no power and no authority, but we give him a lot of power and Authority, we lift him up and keep him up in a higher place. But on the cross, Jesus has nullified all of his powers, brought to nothing, paralyzed him. So Satan has basically been reduced to nothing on the cross. Okay, look at what Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 says. Can somebody read Colossians chapter 2 verse 15? One of our uh, in-person students, uh, sorry, online students, can you read Colossians 2.15, please? Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, 
triumphing over them in it. Amen. So he's saying that um, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, Paul is saying that on the cross, Christ disarmed principalities and powers, and he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing them, or, uh, triumphing over them. Okay. Now these principalities and powers are referring to whom? Demonic hosts. How do we know it's demonic host? Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. What does Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says? Can somebody read Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, please? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Yes. So here, thank you. So here, um, here it's talking about uh, against rulers, authorities, uh, powers of darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms okay so it's basically talking about demonic powers and authorities so on the cross christ stripped satan and all the demonic hosts of all their power and openly displayed his triumph in the heavenly realms okay so we see that christ came to destroy the devil okay so here we need to notice something that christ defeated satan he triumphed over him as a human being okay he was fully man in the flesh he died on the cross and he died um, a sinless life he subdued and condemned sin in the flesh he overpowered satan in the flesh so what is it telling us what is it telling us what is it teaching us Satan has been destroyed, okay? Our enemy has been destroyed. Sorry? He does not have any more power, okay? What does this tell us? Online students, no answers. What happened? Third, the third hour, you will become a little lethargic. Okay, he won the victory over Satan, so we too have the victory over Satan. What else? When Christ won the victory over Satan, he did that as our representative, as a representative of the human race. So that is why God became man. Okay, he could have done that as God, he could have destroyed Satan, but that would have not been any of, uh, you know, would, would not have kind of been a... A place of a model for us that we can also overcome Satan being human just like Jesus was human okay but he became a human being and he won over Satan so that is a you know he's like a representative a model that hey we can also overcome our enemy and he represented us in our humanness and he overcame Satan and he now won the victory and he is the captain of our salvation. He is the captain of our salvation. Like we read in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10. What is the meaning that Jesus is the captain of our salvation? Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10. Can somebody read Hebrews 2 verse 10? Can we have some more um, participation from our online students, please? Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Amen. Thank you, Sanjay. So what does it mean that Jesus is the captain of our salvation? Our leader. Sorry. Uh, captain as in our leader. Okay, our leader. Okay. So when the leader wins the battle, what happens? The entire Victory. team also wins the battle. Okay, that is why in David and when when Goliath was throwing the challenge against the Philistines, he said, "One of you come and fight," because he was so sure he's going to win the battle. And he says, "If I win, 
we are the winners. If you win, you are the winners. That means it's the whole team, right? So Jesus is the captain of our salvation, which means that when whatever he's done on the cross, he did it as a human being, as a human, a representative, as one amongst us as human. And what he has done, what victory he has done, what he has purchased for us becomes our portion, becomes our victory. Okay, becomes something that we can also partake in. So when he won the victory over Satan, automatically we also win the victory. When he has nullified the powers of Satan, for us also, powers of Satan has already been nullified. Satan, we look at Satan as somebody whose uh, powers have been nullified and paralyzed. So we sh Jesus shares his victory from with us. And hence, we share in his victory because he is the captain of our salvation. So because he made the full sufficient perfect, he became that full sufficient perfect sacrifice, we don't have to offer any more sacrifice because he's the captain of our salvation. Okay, so that is another thing that we see. Um, the, the, the first one that we look here in the among the threefold purposes in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 18. The second one is in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 15. Uh, it says, And release those who the through the fear of death were all their lifetime subjected to bondage. Okay. So when Jesus died on the cross, he destroyed the devil and he brought about our deliverance. Okay. So when we, when we are living in sin, we are living under the bondage of Satan, okay? We are subjected to him under his bondage, under his slavery. Uh, we are living through the fear of death. That is why we see that people who have no assurance of salvation, they're so afraid to die, right? They're living totally in fear of curses, they're living totally in fear of the evil one that is going to come and destroy their life. And also they are living in fear of death. So fear of death holds people in bondage as slaves. So that is why it's important that we, you know, that we overcome the spirit of fear. And that is why, you know, it's written in God's word that God has not given us a spirit of timidity or of fear, but of power, love and a sound mind. Okay. So, uh, why? Because fear is from the devil. And once we are uh, afraid of him, he totally takes control of our lives. And our lives are really destroyed. We know, know some of you are living in constant fear, how it paralyzes you. Okay, And we're subject, we're bondaged uh, to Satan all of our lives. Okay, But when Christ died on the cross, you know, he... Um, he delivered us from the power of fear, from the power of sin, from the power of death, and the fear of death and the power of Satan as well. Okay. So the second thing that um, you know, the, the second fold purpose of Jesus becoming human is that he brought us deliverance. The third thing is that um, in verse 17, Christ is the merciful and faithful high priest making atonement for the sins of the people okay so it says here that jesus became like one of us so that he can be a merciful and faithful high priest in performing the duties or the things that are related to god so that he can make the atonement for the sins of the people okay we know that in the old testament who made the sacrifice who uh, when you take your sacrifices who used to do that on behalf of you to, uh, to god it's a high priest it's a priest who would do that so the priest would make atonement for the sins the priest would go into the holy of holies and the priest would represent the people before god okay so in that way we have a great high priest okay and um you know, it's amazing that Jesus became human so that he can be our great high priest. Like we read in Hebrews that, uh, you know, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. Can somebody read that? 
Hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 to 16. Hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 to 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who had passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. Thank you, Angeline. It's good to hear your voice. Um, okay, so here we uh, powerful uh, verses. Here we see that Jesus became a high priest, not as God high priest, but as a man who is a high priest. And why did he become a high, the high priest being fully human? What does it do to us? How does he relate to us? How does it help us? This verse 14 to 16 says, Jesus being a high priest as a human being who represents us, who can understand us, what does it do for, to us? Helps us to? Okay. He accessed, he accessed the intercessor so we can go, we have a, uh, access to the Father. Okay, he's our intercessor. We have access to the Father. Okay. He's able to be that. Uh, resonate what we go through. He's able to sympathize. He's able to empathize with us. He's able to understand with our weakness and therefore be that high priest who's able to intercede. Okay. So uh, remember with Moses and God, God who say, you know, I'm fed up with the stiff neck people. They are stubborn. They are rebellious, you know. But Moses being like one of the people knows that our nature is being stiff neck, stubborn, rebellious and disobedient. And he would, what would he do? He would intercede on behalf of the people and God would relent and hear his prayer. Okay, the same way Jesus, God becoming man, so that he can be that high priest who's able to empathize with our weakness. So he's able to understand our weakness so that he can be that empathizing high priest who's able to intercede on behalf of us. And, you know, know when we are tempted, you know, what we are going through, he can help us. And, you know, because he also was tempted just as we are, but yet without sin. So we also have an example. Say, hey, Jesus was also tempted, but yet he did not give in to temptation. So I can overcome this temptation, but he's also able to empathize, sympathize with our weakness. Sometimes we think nobody understands us. Nobody knows what we are going through. But, you know, Jesus knows what it is to feel lonely, what it is to feel rejected, what it is to feel uh, left out, what it is to feel forsaken. Because he cried out to God, say, uh, you know, uh, oh, uh, why did you forsake me on the cross? You know, so he knows what it is to go through all of these things. So he knows, he understands. And because of what he has done, we are able to approach the throne of grace with confidence because we have this empathizing high priest so god the father you know he is the one who when he looks at sin he judges sin okay but jesus is the one who stands and intercedes and says please forgive selena you know because i paid for her sins and uh, you know and he comes to our aid he helps us the holy spirit is our paracletos one who comes alongside us to aid us Okay, so we see, therefore, in the incarnation, Jesus walked as a man. He was he uh, he was tempted, but he overcame it, and he's able to help us. He's able to assist us. He's able to aid those who are being tempted. So when you are being tempted, know that you're not all alone battling. But Jesus is there because he's there to aid you, help you, and he's able to. Uh, help you to overcome even not only when you are um, tempted but when you're even tested and tried okay isn't that wonderful 
So we are just looking at various things, why God became man, not just because he came to the earth to die for our sins, but so many other various reasons uh, why he became man, why he shared in our humanity, um, why he subjected himself to being fully human uh, so that he can do all of these things for us. Okay, are you all able to understand? Yes, no? Okay. Look at what uh, 1 John, thank you Deepu, 1 John 2, 1 says. Can one of you read that please? Can one of you read that? Shall I go ahead sister? Yeah, 1 John 2, 1. Thank you Lucy, yes, go ahead. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Amen. So it says we have an advocate. That means what does an advocate or lawyer do for you when he's fighting your court case? He defends you. He talks on behalf of you. He gets you out, right, basically. Uh, so Jesus is an intercessor. You know, he's your advocate, he's a lawyer, he stands on behalf of you before the Father, okay? And who is that? Jesus Christ, the righteous one, okay? So isn't that amazing that there is somebody who fights on behalf of you, that somebody is there to speak on your uh, behalf, okay? Um, we look at another point, you know, why did... God have to become flesh. Why did he share in our humanity? To redeem those under the law. We already looked at this, but uh, we will just um, reiterate this and then maybe look at the divine exchange and then finish this lesson. Okay. So to redeem those under the law. Can one of you please read Galatians 4, 4 to 7? Somebody who's not read. In-person student, somebody who's not read. Can you take the mic and read, please? Quickly, give it to any one of them to read. Galatians 4, 4 to 7. But when the fullness of God, when fullness of the time had come, God had sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of son and because you are sons god has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts carrying out abba father therefore you are no longer a slave but a son and if you and if a son then an heir of god through christ amen thank you asapu so here we see that, you know, God always fulfills his word. He fulfills his word in the fullness of time. That means fullness of time is the kairos time. God's time, the fullness of time. So God works in chronos time and chronological time and kairos time. Kairos time is the fullness of time. So even though the incarnation, God had revealed it, Thousands of years before, but it was in God's time, in due season, that God sent his son. Okay, So here in this passage that we read, we look at one of the many purposes or the reasons for incarnation. And that purpose or one of the purpose or reason for incarnation is Christ came to redeem those who are under the law. Okay, so that we can receive the adoption as sons. Okay, so to understand what Paul is writing to the church at Galatia, okay, why is he writing this? Okay, um, let's look at uh, the background to the book of Galatians, okay, and understand this passage, and then this will we will be able to understand in greater measure what Christ came to do. So in this epistle. Like Paul is writing, he's writing to the uh, churches that are uh, located in Asia Minor, which is uh, called Galatia. 
and the church the, the towns in Asia Minor or Galatia is uh, Iconium, Lystra, Antioch, and Derby. Okay, and in, in these churches here, there were both Jews and Gentiles who have come to the faith. And now the Jews who are called as Judaizers who become Christians who come into the church, they still hold on to the Old Testament practices. They still hold on to certain, you know, the Passover, certain rituals, certain customs, circumcision, you know, hold on to the, some old myth, uh, Jewish fables and myths and all of those things. And when they come into the church, they're bringing all of these things. What kind of food you should eat, you know, what days you should practice um, and circumcision. And so they're forcing the Gentiles to follow all of these um, and insisting them to be circumcised and all of these things. And because this was not what Paul was teaching, you know, they began to discredit Paul's apostleship. Okay, they were saying that Paul is inferior to all the other apostles. Because he was telling, hey, you Gentiles, you don't have to be circumcised because it is not by keeping the law that we are made righteous, but it is by, you know, uh, by what Jesus has done on the cross. It is by a faith in Christ Jesus. It is by, uh, sorry, it's by grace through faith that, you know, we receive um, what, you know, we are made righteous. It's not by keeping the law because you've been trying to keep the law but of no avail so he's saying and uh, when he's saying all of this the, the people were looking and telling the jews specifically were saying that you know um paul is an inferior apostle so to address this issue not only for the churches at galatia he was doing that even at the church at rome ephesus corinth he's writing this letter so in, in chapters 1 and 2, basically Paul defends his apostleship and he declares that he received the gospel not by the teachings of our other apostles, but by Christ's revelation himself. You know, the 17 years of Paul were the secret years of Paul when he did a little um, ministry, but most of the time was spent in Arabia where he was receiving a lot of revelations which he was later on writing to the uh, churches okay and um, he's uh, so he's now talking about you know uh, how the law was intended only as an intermediary or a disciplinary system you know and christ came to you know christ was the end of the law like i was saying all of the old testament prophecies rituals sacrifices all pointed to christ and you know was all fulfilled in christ in the same way the law was just an intermediary or a disciplinary system and christ was the end of the law which means you know christ came to keep the law but then he also came to show us how we can fulfill the law or we can obey the commandments not in our strength but through the power of the holy uh, spirit okay so paul is now showing um, those who belong to christ that they inherit the blessings okay and they can overdo or outcome the curses or the condemnation or the curse of the law by you know receiving christ and the righteousness that comes through believing in christ okay so that is why he is uh, writing this and he's saying he's talking about the law but even if you look at romans chapter 7 you know in romans chapter 7 verse 7 verse 12 verse 14 you know paul is saying that the law was good it served a purpose and what was that purpose the law made us aware of sin so if you look at verse 7 in romans chapter 7 paul is saying you know uh, the law exposed sin that means the law showed us hey we are missing the mark we're doing something wrong only when you have rules and you break the rules you know that you have done something wrong yes or no all of you with me yes so what did the old testament law do it exposed our sin it showed our sin and it showed the sinful desires of the flesh so none of them had an excuse to say you know how are we breaking the law remember if you read some of the old testament passages the old test the, the israelites cried out to god and say what what did we do wrong 
we kept your riches, we did the sacrifices. What did we do? Wrong. So the law was something that showed them, hey, you are living for the sinful desires of the flesh. In Romans chapter 7, verse 12, Paul says, the law is holy, just, and good. Verse 14, he says, the law is spiritual. It is given by God in Romans chapter 7, verse 14. So what basically Paul is talking about in Galatians, in the book of Galatians and Romans, is that, hey, the law served its purpose. What was the purpose that the law served? It pointed out sin in our lives. And it was pointing out to somebody who was going to come who's going to enable us to fulfill the righteous demands of the law. It was pointing us to Jesus Christ. Yes, the law is good. It served a purpose. The law made us aware of sin. But Paul is saying, hey, the more I'm aware of the law, the more I'm aware of the sin, the more I want to break it. Right? And why do we break it? Because he's saying, sin dwells in me. Because in my flesh, there is nothing good. And he's saying the law of sin is working in my flesh. Now, you need to be very, very careful. In some places in the New Testament, when you read the law of sin, the law of the flesh, the law of uh, the Holy Spirit, what does it mean? It's not talking about the law means the Old Testament law. It means the power of sin, the dominance of sin. The control of sin. So wherever you read in the in the New Testament where you read the law of sin, it's basically talking about the dominance of sin, the control of sin or the power of sin. The law of the flesh, basically talking about the power of the flesh, the dominance of the flesh. Okay, The law of the spirit of life, it's talking about the power, the dominance and the control of the spirit of life. So Paul is saying, hey, the more I know the law, the more I want to keep it, the more I find myself sinning because the law of sin dwells in me okay or the law of sin is working in my flesh or that means the dominance the control the power of sin is working in my flesh and he's saying sin is a law which is controlling my body sin is a law means not sin is the old testament laws is, is a sin but he's saying the sin is a con law means sin is a control or dominance a power that is now controlling my body. Okay, are you all able to understand? Okay, so when you read some places law, you need to understand whether it's talking about Old Testament law or you know law as in 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 terms of dominance, power, and control. Okay, so as Paul is explaining in Galatians, the law in fact served a purpose. It preserved the people, you know, and uh, through the Savior who would come. So the law was established in Jesus Christ. The law was upheld and made to stand in Jesus Christ. So what Paul is saying, the real problem is not the law, but the sin that rules and dominates our flesh and the members of our body. Yes, the law required us to do certain spiritual things in our own strength, but we were failing to do it because we had to do it in our own strength. It was impossible for us to keep the law because the law of sin dominated our flesh. The power of sin dominated our flesh. So sin was more noticeable by the law. That means we knew that we were sinful people because we kept on breaking the law and we kept on running with our sacrifices to the temple. Okay. And the law, the Old Testament law, exposed the sin in our flesh, okay? But, you know, we know that the law is good. It's not burdensome. You know, uh, some of us think, oh, keeping the Old Testament or keeping the commandments and the laws of God is burden. It's burdensome to us. It's not burdensome. How do we know that? If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11 to 14, are all of you with me or... All of you have gone away to some spiritual retreat somewhere in your minds or some oasis or sleeping. Okay, thank you. So Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 11 to 14, you know, we read verse 11. It says, for this command which I command you today is not too hard for you or too distinct. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 
11. Okay, so he's um, saying that command which God has, commandments which God has given you is not too hard for you to keep. Look at what 1 John chapter 5 verse 2 and 3 says. By this we know that we love the children of God. Um, when we love God and keep his commandments, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Okay, so God's command is not a burden. Okay, it's not burdensome. And James chapter 1 verse 25 says, but he who looks into the perfect law of freedom, that means the law brings us freedom. But in the Old Testament, God noticed that the law was not bringing any kind of freedom for people. It was becoming too burdensome. They were like, Ayo, we have to go and make this sacrifice. So they would take some animal, some a sickly animal and you know bird or something and just do it for the sake of sacrificing and they would go back and commit the same sin so the law was becoming very burdensome for people and god was getting angry because every time they are not keeping the law every time they're making the sacrifices and that's why he says in haggai shut the door of the temple why because your worship is like noise to my ears and your sacrifice is displeasing in my sight that means and he you know if you read Haggai it says God says look at the sacrifices that you're bringing will you take the same kind of animal and give it to your leaders to your officers you bring sickly animals lame animals and you expect me to receive these sacrifices that means God is saying hey everything is going down with these people they're not able to keep the law they're not able to give some right sacrifices everything is going haywire and so he sends his son who, who keeps the law, who is able to help us to keep the law. And he, how is he able to help us to keep the law? By giving us the Holy Spirit, by being an example himself. Uh, so, you know, God, the, 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 coming back to Galatians, the Jews were just wanting to keep all these, they were bound by these rituals and traditions. And so Paul is saying, hey, all these rituals and traditions are not going to help you keep the law. Okay, he saying, you know, what is going to help you to keep the law is, you know, Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. Can somebody read that? Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. 5 verses 1. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm therefore and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Amen. So thank you, Deepu. So why is he saying that? He's saying, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty, but which Christ has made us free. And don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. That means don't be caught up in traditions and rituals because Christ has set us free from everything. He's given us freedom and liberty. In Christ, we have freedom and liberty. And don't be entangled with the yoke of uh, bondage. Look at what he says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature, rather serve one another in love. Amen. So here again, he's saying, hey, you have been set free. You have been given liberty and freedom in Christ. Don't use that liberty as an opportunity to fulfill the desires of your flesh, but use that to love and serve one another. So it's basically saying that, hey, we have been set free from all these traditions and rituals, even these sacrifices. So God is not looking, you know, for sacrifices, but he's looking for obedience obedience in christ and we've already been set free so paul is saying you know christ has come to redeem us from the curse of the law okay we're no longer under the curse of the law but we are and we come under the blessings and how do we come under the blessings because you know christ has kept the law and he has given us freedom and we can enjoy this freedom and we can receive the blessings okay before we end, can we just take one minute? Anyone has any questions, any doubts? I hope you all were able to understand what I was teaching through Galatians and Romans. Yes, no? Okay. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. 
Any questions? No? Okay, fine. We'll end class. Um, we'll look at a divine exchange uh, in the next class. Okay? Have a good day, everyone. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, sister.